Good morning, everyone. I'm Deb Sullivan, trainer from the Academic Affairs Office in the College of Arts and Sciences. I was standing over there. Uh, I just want to welcome you to Prime Time at the Library. It's a great collaboration between uh, the library, be you friends of the library, uh, faculty development in the College of Arts and Sciences, and a number of other offices. Um, if you're looking for upcoming primetime events, they're on the library's website and events calendar, and there's also posters kind of throughout the um, campus. And if there's somebody that really wanted to be here this morning and could make it, as you can tell, we record them, and they're available on the library website. <laughs> a little advertising for upcoming primetime. On Thursday, March 27th, Natalie Beezer, Director of Disability Services and Resources, will challenge our ideas about disability with her presentation, Challenging the Disability Paradigm. Disability is a part of uh, diversity and reconciliation. Today we have a presentation by one of our Faculty Excellence Award winners. Each year, um, the Professional Development Committee takes recommendations from the faculty and chooses someone who's exhibited excellence in either the area of teaching, scholarship, or service. And Dr. Sando was the um, recipient of this year's Faculty Excellence for Scholarship. Uh, Dr. Standow, Sandow is widely uh, recognized for her research accomplishments, particularly in the specialty of cardiovascular health. Her contributions to the discipline include an active clinical practice at United Hospital and membership in the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, Minnesota Nursing Association Foundation Board, and a number of other committees and organizations. Dr. Sandow has an active research agenda and a sustained history of publication, including 11 articles in the past five years. She makes regular presentations within the professional community, receiving the 2012 Research Poster Award at the National Teaching Institute and Critical Care Exposition, and a faculty learning about geriatrics fellow at the University of Minnesota Hartford Foundation. At Bethel, she's been an Edmund Scholar and served on the International and Off-Campus Studies Committee and as a certified nurse educator. We're very fortunate to have Kristen with us at Bethel and all the work she does with students and uh, faculty, and also to hear about her work today. Thank you, Doug. Well, it's good to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for the honor of the excellent award. Um, that was really um, wonderful. Thank you for nominating me. Um, so today, I get to talk a little bit about my research and with particular emphasis on the bridging that occurs. Um, there's so much work to do and we can't do it alone. So fortunately, we can um, work with our relationships between academia and institutions uh, of healthcare, and that's what I'm really excited about, um, the collaboration that we've been able to have. So I put bridging in the title of the talk um, because it really is about building bridges with other healthcare um, practitioners, uh, with social worker, with chaplain, and with the patients themselves. So of emphasis today, you're actually going to hear one of the patients um, himself um, talk about his experience with left ventricular assist device. So I do want to recognize Dr. Barb Hoagland, who um, is an integral part of this team from Bethel, who's not able to be here today because Tuesdays and Thursdays are skills and clinical days. So um, she is here in spirit and how. Um, so we're going to back up a little bit and talk about why you would end up with a left ventricular assist device, and it would be because you have heart failure. Um, and heart failure, you probably know someone with heart failure. We're not talking about electricity. We're actually talking about a pump problem. And uh, there's at least 5 million people with heart failure in the United States. And we don't have a cure for that. Um, so we do have some interventions, some therapies. Um, for end-stage heart failure, uh, one of your options uh, traditionally has been a heart transplant. And now, more recently, a left ventricular assist device or an LVAD. Um, and so I'm going to show you a, a little bit here. <coughs> Um, for background about the LVAD here. I tell everyone to listen about this device because it saved my life. It really comes down to very, very basic things. Either you want to live or you want to give up. And I just very much wanted to live. When I woke up from surgery and felt so full of life and energy, I knew I'd made the right decision. The main thing, I'm able to get up and I'm able to go. I can't say enough good about it. These people are talking about their decision to have an implanted heart pump to treat their severe heart failure. The pump is commonly called a VAD, short for ventricular assist device. 
This type of therapy is sometimes referred to as MCS, or mechanical circulatory support. For the right person, a VAD can mean a longer life with improved quality of life. However, the decision to have a VAD is one that should be considered very carefully. This... So, we're going to consider this decision carefully. We need to have data on what is quality of life with an LVAD. Um, we, we don't want to go through a procedure that costs $80,000 that changes your life uh, you know, uh, in, in, in 100% of your daily activities um, and that is a major uh, surgical procedure in, involving a, a, thor a, a thoracic surgeon um, and many days in the hospital uh, without, without considering what is quality of life and will it be better after my LVAD. So I would just actually like to throw out to you, how would you define quality of life? Just get your kind of thoughts here. If you were going to decide what is quality of life, what would make me choose to have this extensive procedure? What's important to you? Anyone? More time with my children and grandchildren. Time with children and grandchildren. Okay. Anyone else? Making contributions to life. Making contributions to life. So productivity there. Able to do um, the activities of daily li living independently. To be able to do activities of daily living independently. Okay, okay those are those are great answers. And and what's interesting when you're trying to measure concept of quality of life is that you're going to have variability. What's important to someone else might not be as important as the other person. And so it is a, a difficult concept to measure. And indeed, we have to uh, to um, consider that it is subjective. And I, as a clinician or a physician should not be making the decision for you what is quality of life. That should be something that you decide. Um, so um, this VAX uh, provides a little bit of an inside look on what a left ventricular assist device um, is. Uh, so uh, coming out of your left ventricle then, your blood would be, uh, would be uh, exiting and giving that left ventricle a rest. And so we actually have some patients who are able to use the LVAD as a bridge to recovery. So some patients have had a period of myopathy, then um, after living with an LVAD for a while, they actually re uh, regain function and are able to have the LVAD explanted. <laughs> um, we have also a subgroup of the population that uses LVAD as a destination therapy, which means that they're not a, they're not a candidate for transplant. Maybe they're too old, maybe they've had metastatic cancer, and they're just gonna have that LVAD to give them a better quality of life until they die. And then the third uh, subpopulation would be uh, people who are using an LVAD as a bridge to transplant. Um, so then um, the LVAD pumps from the left ventricle into the aorta out to the rest of your body then. Um, right here I want to emphasize is the exit site to your skin. So this then comes out of your belly and is connected to a system controller that needs batteries then to be able to um, continue to, to work. Um, so yes, indeed, some patients say I'm battery operated. <laughs> so this is the outside look, and the size of this pump is pretty big right now. Ideally, we want engineers to continue on their work to provide us uh, with bats that are um, that, that are that are wireless that don't have that exit um, drive line exiting. Um, it's not happening yet, um, and uh, you can see that there's a lot of bandages, and so some patients will talk about the cost that may or may not be covered with their insurance. Um, showering is something that they can do eventually, uh, but they cannot ever swim and take an immersive bath. Um, and then um, this gentleman is showing a vest that he wears, and um, one of the patients that we interviewed uh, used athletic pants, um, like Zuba pants, is that what they're called? to put the batteries on either side because he didn't want to look sick. He didn't want people to look at him and say, what are those batteries for? Um, so uh, you guys <laughs> talked about being productive, spending time with your family, and um, being able to live a normal life, which I put in quotes because what is normal to you might not be normal to me, but in terms of the activities of daily living. So this is a, a summary of some of the conceptualizations of quality of life in previous cardiovascular research. Um, but before I can say to someone with an LVAD, I get it, I know how you define quality of life, I really need to interview them. And that is qualitative research. And so we're not ready to throw a survey out to someone in a new population from, uh, from an existing uh, 
group of, of surveys that we have. So we really had to take some steps back to do this. Um, in understanding uh, quality of life, um, we need to um, take a look at it uh, alongside um, the, the risks to this procedure. Um, because what you do, you know, as in life, is you weigh out your um, benefits and your risks, right? And you want to see is it worth it or not. So we need to have some data available. And uh, clearly, uh, we do have data regarding um, uh, morbidity and mortality within LVADs. There are risks with the surgery itself. Um, blood clotting is a problem. People are on anticoagulants, and they have um, they have historically had a, a significant problem with GI bleeds. Um, infection is a problem, at, uh, very common at the driveline exit site then, uh, no matter if you're doing meticulous care. Uh, failure of the device itself and having to emergently get another LBAD or become one A on a transplant list. Um, neurological problems, strokes can occur. One of the patients that we interviewed um, during our year and a half had a stroke in between our first and second interview. And he lost sight in his eye and he had memory uh, changes and difficulties. And so it was particularly poignant to talk with him and ask him the question, uh, we had asked, would you do it over again? And he paused and he said, yes, if I had my wife with me. Um, uh, anxiety, depression um, is a fascinating field. Do we have any psychologists here? Uh, okay, well, go ahead. <laughs> this is a fascinating area for more research and in terms of the uh, uh, support groups and interventions for people with an LVAD, uh, really a huge area that needs uh, further addressing. Right side of heart failure can develop in death as well. So it's not something you would go into uh, lightly. You want to make sure the benefits outweigh the risks. So who does LVADs? Um, internationally, there's at least 200 centers. There are three in Minnesota. And I've had the privilege of working with the Minneapolis Heart Institute um, uh, is with Abbott Northwestern Hospital that Dr. Barb Copeland and I got to work with and work with their clinicians and their patients. So we have a um, collaboration uh, then uh, with these two institutions and that's part of the bridging that I'm talking about today and I'm so grateful for their partnership. Um, some pictures here. Uh, how did I get connected with them? I work uh, at an Alina hospital and I went to graduate school with Dr. Sue Sendelbach, who's a clinical nurse specialist and director of research at Abbott Northwestern. And so she uh, actually connected with me several years ago to do quality of life substudy of um, some patients with aortic stenosis. So that's how my initial entry into doing research with Minneapolis Heart Institute began um, with my quality of life background. And then uh, she, uh, she decided that I would be the right person to work with their team that looked at um, biobehavioral outcomes in LVAD patients. And I was happy to do that, climbed aboard, but realized as we talked about, I didn't, there is no LVAD quality of life survey available in the world. And so in order to develop one, we had to take a qualitative approach, and I didn't have that expertise. So I um, worked with Dr. Barb Hoagland and I invited her aboard the team then um, with her qualitative expertise to be able to um, work with me in doing those initial interviews with the patients to understand what is quality of life, to develop a valid conceptual definition, and then a quantitative questionnaire. Dr. David Feldman has been um, wonderful to work with in terms of um, bridging. He is a, a, our primary physician on the study. Uh, he's a cardiologist um, who is an expert in LVAD, and he manages um, overall patient care um, with the LVAD patients. And, um, he uh, is very interprofessional and invited me then to um, uh, test our quantitative quality of life measure in a uh, couple national studies, actually, uh, controlled randomized, uh, randomized trials that are coming up this year and next year um, in a consortium with the National Heart Lung and Blood Institutes at um, seven stem cell centers here across the United States. So bridging has been wonderful, and um, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to work with these people. A couple more pictures here. Terry Weaver is the LVAD nurse clinician um, that has been integral in this research, and the patients do what she says. If she says, oh, I've got a study that you might want to take part in, Carrie is our key person um, that gets patients to consider um, whether they would like to do that or not. And um, you'll see a little bit of her in a minute. Part of this biobehavioral package that we wanted to study also included neurocognition. So we have a neuropsychologist, uh, Kyle Hardison from Abbott Northwestern, and Sue Sendelbach is the nurse that um, helped devise the package of neurocognitive testing then. 
um, the advanced heart failure team um, also included uh, uh, Lewis Lewis is a surgeon cardiothoracic surgeon um, the director of transplant Francis Hoffman and McDonald is our social worker do we have any social workers present okay this social worker she is the one who screens patients to decide whether or not they can handle an LVAD she is the physicians defer to her basically whether or not someone is a, is going to be safe and able to have the support to work successfully with this high technology. And then our chaplain, Ken Burt. So it's fabulous to be able to work at a site where a chaplain is an integral part of uh, the uh, LVAD team. Do we have any chaplains? Any seminary people here? Okay, we have one pastor here as well. <laughs> so that's exciting. And then a uh, statistician, um, Ross Gabber. Um, so in terms of biobehavioral outcomes, um, we're looking primarily at neurocognition and quality of life. And um, our sample is a prospective sample of patients at Abbott who are receiving this uh, LVAD then. Um, and this is the initial team that started out with the study. So the first, uh, the first question is, is there an existing tool? Can we slap a tool on, you know, a questionnaire, is it available? And then just add that to the neurocognitive testing? No, there isn't. And so that's why we had to go ahead and, um, and decide this population is absolutely unique enough. They need their own questionnaire. And one of the people that we interviewed said, well, you know what? I think there needs to be a whole new form because I don't feel like I'm in heart failure right now. So after she received the LVAD, we, we actually gave her two quality of life tools for people in heart failure. And she pushed them aside and said, no, these don't cover it for me. I need my own tool. We as all that patients need our own quality of life tool. So that was very affirming that the kind of research we were doing uh, was important then. So um, we started with qualitative research. We actually um, uh, got our conceptual definition, which I'll show you in a bit. And we, we asked our patients to look at two commonly used quality of life tools in heart failure. And um, they said that they didn't cover uh, enough for them. They were not comprehensively valid. And then we developed the quality of life with an LVAT tool, um, Dr. Hoagland and Sam Dalton, that we are currently testing now. So I want to round back to the patient perspective. This is really all about the patients. And so um, I want to introduce you to Peter Quimby, who is an incredibly articulate man with an LVAT. He's not an LVAT patient, he's a man living with an LVAT. And here he is with his wife and with Dr. Sun, one of the cardiothoracic surgeons, his family. And he has his own blog. And um, I think that this is going to help you really get an understanding of the whole procedure and perspective. I first learned of my heart disease when I had my exophysical getting out of the military. I was diagnosed with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. And at the time, I was told that it could lead to a heart transplant someday. I got treatment uh, at the local VA hospital for, for nine years. And in March of 2011, after several tough months of dealing with the flu and colds, um, I began to very rapidly develop onset of heart failure symptoms. I met Peter um, just three or four days before he had his LVAD implanted. He came to us uh, in the severe cardiogenic shock and also in, um, I think, just a state of shock. They couldn't find my, my, my blood pressure, basically, and they admitted me. And after they did some blood work and other tests, they came back and said that my EF was five, that basically my heart wasn't moving. I was in profound heart failure. And so they put a swan catheter in me and an inner aortic wound pump and transferred me down to Abbott Northwestern, where I was also told that I had liver, kidney, and GI tract failure on top of heart failure, and that if I'd stayed at home another four hours, I would have died. And so we had to discuss these advanced options to him on a quick basis. And so it was very shocking for him. It was very shocking for his family. As I was sitting there bleeding, I reached my weakest point. This is a misery that you cannot fathom. And I had to accept it. I thought giving, having the LVAD gave me the best shot to have the greatest longevity in my life. And that's how I made that decision. Alina's approach to the LVAD is uh, a team approach. We have six cardiologists and soon to have three cardiovascular surgeons. The specialty care perfusion group helped us 
as we increased our population and increased our numbers of destination therapy patients and therefore became an integral part in the operating room as we performed more and more of that implant. My experience with the specialty care perfusionist has been outstanding. So as VAD coordinators, we're the ones who actually start the LVAD pump. And when we do start the pump, as we're doing that, we are key players with the perfusionist um, as to how much, how much flow we're getting through these patients. So as I'm going up on my pump and they're going down, are we adequately allowing the heart to fill? Are we adequately perfusing this patient? And a good communication between team members is it's imperative to a good outcome. Now that I've gone through this experience, I feel more emotionally, physically, intellectually, spiritually healthy than I've ever felt in my life. I'm a national fitness instructor at the YMCA. I do competitive road races when I have the time to prepare for them. I did the Minneapolis duathlon this past summer. I teach cycle at the YMCA. We're doing the insanity workouts. And in fact, if you were to go over there and ask my kids, they would tell you that bionic daddy is way cooler than, <laughs> than sick daddy was. Being an LVAD coordinator is a, is a, special, uh, a special nursing that I really never thought I would be blessed to be a part of. Um, we get to know these patients and their families and so we get to see patients go from almost death to living their life again and it is it is the circle of life for us. Try getting your head around the fact that I've got a foreign body in me that is pumping my blood and keeping me alive. I mean, think about that. This is a miracle. We are seeing the intersection of medicine and science and clinical care, and that's the challenge. That's the inspiration. Come to work motivated every day knowing that there is somebody out there like me who gets a life back because of what you do. I do come to work motivated. I am so fortunate to be able to do this kind of research. So I do feel very blessed for all these bridges. And very interesting because um, Peter is not a particularly spiritual man in the traditional religious sense of the term. And did you hear what he said? I feel more healthy. He said physically, mentally, he said spiritually. And so one of the things we learned when we interviewed our patients um, uh, was that even those who didn't have a, a, a traditional religious faith um, actually did um, discuss some pieces of life that do have to do with spirituality. And so we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, uh, so a really holistic assessment. So I just have to say for full disclosure, I do not have any stock in medical device companies. And yes, that was a thank you video for a, a perfusion uh, company, I believe, but um, I, I don't have stock. I'm not promoting uh, any particular company stock. Now, I'd like you to contrast that with a gentleman who's very similar in age to Peter. Uh, this is Alex Smith, and he also has his information on the internet, so I'm not violating any HIPAA uh, laws here. And um, Alex Smith is similar to Peter Quimby in that he's a military uh, vet, and he, he actually was in the Gulf War. And, and after uh, the Gulf War, he um, had uh, many uh, infections then um, had some pulmonary infections uh, then and uh, and ended up having an LVAD placed and um, he says that even walking with his dog tank is an existing ordeal um, and he uh, has been through a divorce and he uh, tries to go back to work because uh, he's he's actually from the UK and he's been told he is uh, healthy enough that he should be working and he shouldn't have disability. Uh, so he is uh, very frustrated, he's exhausted, uh, he's depressed. And um, when we compare these two men, um, one would say, my quality of life is great. And he actually said to the clinicians, you didn't give me a life, you gave me my life back. I can do what I want to do. Compare and contrast to Alex who says, I am five seconds away from death at any time. My life ended when my heart failed. This machine allows me to exist, but not to live. Wow, that's quite a range. And so to be able to um, 
conceptualize what is quality of life and then operationally measure that is important because we want patients to be able to, to um, be aware of what they're getting into and also be able to tell us where they are in that range of quality of life so we can look at any particular interventions that might be helpful to improve their quality of life so that they're not living in their own personal home. Um, as Alex describes. So how do we traditionally define success? Well, did the patient live? Is, you know, is that that's, uh, basic. pretty basic then? <laughs> um, and uh, how, how did they come through the procedure, the surgery, or the treatment, and are they able to go back to work? Well, it's bigger than that, as you know, and um, as we've been hearing from patients then. So quality of life has become um, quite popular in the last three decades as something that we need to measure. It actually started out um, with Campbell and sociology um, looking at quality of life and with, um, with psychology as well. And now more in healthcare. And so when I first started uh, 15 years ago quality of life research, one of the cardiologists at the hospital where I worked smiled and he joked with me and he said, oh, you're measuring the soft outcomes now. And there is a little bit of uh, in, in, um, insinuation that it was a little less important then. And I just smiled back and nodded, yes, yes I am. So uh, what I think we've come to know now is that quality of life really is a, a valid uh, area we need to research. And there are some, um, some parameters that we set around it in order to be good research or quality of life. Understand that it's subjective. I can't tell you what your quality of life is. The physician can't. Uh, and it's temporal, meaning that it's going to change. And you might, you know, have a great quality of life after your stroke, but then when you, uh, your partner leaves you, you know, that's going to that's gonna change, multidimensional as well then. Um, and that's what Peter was talking about, the multidimensionality. So in order to get to a clear operational definition, um, we need to figure out what are the domains in quality of life that we need to measure. Um, we'll talk about that. And we do want to get at disease symptoms and general overall satisfaction, um, which actually is quite simple. Cantrell decided we could just ask people to think of a ladder. On a ladder, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your quality of life on 1 to 10? And actually turned out to be quite a valid measurement of them. So for our focus groups then, um, uh, the doctor uh, Barb Holtland and I worked on, um, we asked our LVED patients um, to uh, come twice and talk with us. And it turned out that, a lot, that we actually had to change the IRB because um, there aren't that many LVED patients yet and to try to time it during their checks to the clinic to get a group of people didn't work real well, so we asked the IRB to let us do individual interviews and change our protocol that way then uh, for some of the sessions then. But we started out very open. Um, tell us your first name, how long you've had your LVAD, and then um, basically what, when, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the phrase quality of life? So we wanted to start out uh, with, with, uh, without our preconceptions. And I am not an LVAD clinician. I work with heart failure patients, but I'm not an LVAD clinician. And so I was able to put aside uh, biases. I didn't have too many. I didn't know that many of them um, at the time. Then um, uh, there were some prompting questions. I won't give you all those. Uh, today here, but um, you can sure read about them in an article if you want. And then in focus group B, we actually had the survey started. And so we had multiple drafts of the survey that the patients actually gave us feedback on. They said, no, no, that reading's not quite right. Or um, one of the gentlemen said, you don't have anything in there about my appetite. That's important. And, um, mm -hmm. and so in terms of face validity from the patients, um, that was achieved. And we also talked about um, the format of the survey, the language, and they helped coach us and they taught us. We learned so much. So we only had 11 participants, um, which for those that do quantitative research, like my cardiologists, sometimes they don't understand that that is actually an accept, acceptable number in uh, qualitative research if you are spending um, enough time with them, if you have credibility and um, you have um, an audit trail and, and you have uh, spent time with them and we had two interviews with them. Um, traditionally, uh, LVED patients have been white males and that was uh, similar in our sample as well then. Um, so in terms of how would you describe quality of life, um, some of what they said was what you guys said here. Um, and this one I thought was particularly meaningful, the amount of joy and peace that you receive from day-to-day -day living. Um, so yes, it is a lot about activities um, and normalcy, but what came out in the discussions, we had an older man and a younger man, both vets, and they said, um, 
the, the ones that I want to be able to provide for my family. I've got to be able to install doors and mow the lawn. And the other one said, you know what, I'm retired. All that matters to me is that I can go to town once in a while and um, you know, sit in the yard. And so your expectations change. And so it was very important that we, that we were aware of that and included that in our definition. It was messy work. And um, this is just some of the uh, category, categorizing that we um, did. We did end up with five major life domains, which was consistent with a lot of quality of life literature. So physical, emotional, social or role, spiritual or for the non-religious meaning, purpose in life. And then um, a cognitive domain as well that had primarily to do with memory and focus then. Um, and so what's particularly exciting for me working at Bethel is to be able to integrate my faith with my research. And so I was very excited because this reminded me of a verse in Luke. When a young man asked Jesus, what is the most important commandment God gave us? He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The package was already there <laughs> thousands of years ago. Uh, and so it was very fun to be able to have approached this um, in a, in a very, in a, with a blank slate, with a group of all that patients, and come out with these same domains. Um, so just briefly, some um, anecdotes or some quotes that people said that were supporting us uh, domains so that you don't think I'm making it up. I'll have <laughs> some of the quotes from physical. One of my big problems yet with the rehab is balance. Um, actually, the flow of blood adjusted the way they moved. Some of them had a trouble. If they got down the garden, they were very dizzy getting up. They weren't used to a different blood flow then. Um, and then another person said, my quality of life is like, well, it's like I'm not even sick. Wow. So um, here's just an example of the quantitative uh, item that we put on the questionnaire. I feel like I can do activities that I enjoy. And that was very important to the patients. To, to, they wanted to define what they enjoyed or what was important to them. Um, emotional. This was very poignant. One man said, for a good week, a week and a half, I'd wake up, hook, unhook myself, put batteries on, go for a walk or something. And I'd be like, look at me. I have batteries. I have an extension cord coming out of my belly. And you know, I cried. So this is a man, you know, sharing sharing with uh, with us about this. And another man said, "Since I've been home, I have not had one issue with depression at all." Um, so uh, another man said, "You don't talk to somebody about the challenges, you know? It's very unmanly." <laughs> so that speaks to some of the support groups that are very important to have to be able to say, you know, it's okay to talk about feelings. Then um, one of the questions I'm able to talk about my condition and treatment. So did they have someone that they could talk to? For social or role, one of the men said, the kids like Bionic Daddy better. And they, he was describing his sour disposition was associated with how poor he was physically. He didn't know that until he, til he had recovered then. Um, one gentleman talked about he couldn't work because of being disabled, and he, he lost his job. So he started volunteering at the food shelf once a week, and he said, um, helping out, I wasn't even able to do wash dishes once camping. So you know, well you can't get wet. So I put a big towel over me just to protect it. You've got to help out and you just got to think of ways to protect yourself too. Um, and one uh, woman worked online for her family. She also was not able to work, so she worked online for her family business. They can't really afford to pay me, but it gives me a reason to get up, you know, in the morning. So contributing to the well being of others. And you guys mentioned that. Having feeling like you're productive in life in some way is important. And then appearance also went with social. Uh, one woman said, until I figured out a tank tops and bigger shirts, you know, I was struggling with what I had trying to make it work and I just couldn't get it. And one gentleman said, they're like, where's your stuff? So the other gentleman with LVATS, they wanted to know where his batteries were. Then everybody's seeing my bag, you have to carry this big black bag everywhere you go because it's got your backup supplies in it. Um, Where's your hardware, you know? And I'd rather just hide the stuff in my pockets and wear my shirt out and not look like some sick guy walking around. So one of the sample questionnaire items uh, that we put was, I feel bothered by how the bad makes me look. And then for spiritual well-being. After surgery was not fun and I was thinking that God was, you know, saying should I take her or not? She actually used the analogy of God flipping a coin and whether she was gonna live or die. That's how she felt after surgery. Um, a lot of people talked about the support uh, um, 
that people provided after after surgery, the patient actually can't be alone. And um, per protocol with Minneapolis Heart, they can't be alone for one month. Day and night. Um, and then one gentleman who was self-described as non-religious said, I really haven't gone to church since I've been a little kid. So, you know, most people go to church on Sunday. I fish. It gives me peace, even when you're not really supposed to be in a boat. <laughs> um, so one of our sample questions was, I believe God or a higher power cares for me. It's not that God exists. It's that he exists and cares for you. And that came out. And the non-religious, um, they were okay. We said, are you okay with this having a spiritual or meaning portion of this? And they said, yes, but he's very specific and, um, and uh, to, to each individual then. And finally, mental or cognitive. Um, one, one woman describes feeling so good immediately upon waking up from surgery, probably day three then. She was almost before. Because with heart failure, you have reduced cognitive perfusion. And so she actually felt better right away. And other people um, were complaining that they had word-finding difficulty, uh, were having trouble remembering things. And so uh, there was some, um, some variability here. It, um, overall, it seemed like things began to get better um, about by uh, a few months post-operatively with the word-finding. Remember, this is a very small qualitative sample then. So one of our questions dealt with memory then. So uh, poll across the room. If you ended up with an LVAD, what would you miss the most? Having a palpable pulse, being able to sleep on your belly, swimming, taking a bath, or walking through security with ease at the airport? <laughs> number five. Number five. <laughs> yeah, number five. Yeah. A lot of anger developed with that with one gentleman, too. It's hard to travel with an LVAD. People say, take the bag up. I can't take the bag up. Take the bag up. I can't take the bag up. <laughs> <laughs> and so we do have some education to do uh, nationally as well. So um, in particular, a lot of them missed um, being able to really get dirty and bathe um, and being able to, uh, that, was, that was a big thing. A woman, one woman summarized, no one can prepare you for this lifestyle. I mean, living attached to cords, carrying around batteries. <laughs> so what kind of pre-op education could we have done? Probably wouldn't be uh, really effective. So looking back on our journey over the last two and a half years, um, the need was identified for a quantitative tool. And before we did that, we had to develop a, 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 a conceptual definition. Um, and so we started with a, a qualitative study then. Um, and um, we, uh, we now have a draft questionnaire. It's actually, our, it's called the um, FALDAD, Quality of Life with an LVAD, then, with a ventricular assist device um, that Dr. Hoagland and I um, developed. And we're currently um, doing some uh, prospective testing of it for validity and reliability. So back to bridging, again, I'm so thankful for my um, contacts and my connections, and I talk about the three C's. So your contacts are your partnerships, and we really, um, there's just no way we should be working alone. As a university, we need to be continually uh, connecting with the community, and I have the uh, privilege of working with, uh, with, uh, with Minneapolis Heart Institute in this particular initiative. Cooperative projects, um, and um, we need to uh, figure out what we can lend our strengths to so we can get the best package of strengths to deal with um, with the problem. And then cash, we need money to do this kind of research. And so I'm very thankful and I want to recognize our, uh, our donors, our funders here, Abbott Northwestern Hospital Foundation for the initial qualitative interviews, um, Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation for the full vital and behavioral uh, grant that we got for our quality of life and neurocognition and then for ongoing testing of the uh, QualVAT survey, the uh, Minnesota Industry Association Foundation. Um, here's our um, article that, uh, that described the interviews and the uh, conceptual definition of quality of life for patients with an LVAD. Final answer. Being well enough to do and enjoy day-to-day -day activities that are important to me. So really that subjective, um, that component um, stood out, and then we had the domains identified then. Um, so we have a 49-item questionnaire. We're hoping to make it shorter. So with the process of factor analysis, taking a look at are some of the questions covering the same thing. So that's what we're doing now with our prospective uh, testing then. Um, and it is organized by life domains. The patients in our interview groups liked that. Um, there's no aggregate score of the domains because you might say your physical domain is more important than your uh, than your emotional domain or vice versa. And I can't tell that for you. That's your decision. We do ask them instead to give one for all 
scale of one to ten for what it's like for Cantrell's ladder. And then because it is a new survey, a new questionnaire, we did add an open eye ended question. Did we miss something? What else do you want to tell us? We don't want to assume that we do know it all here. Um, so these are the measure points as we're doing our prospective testing right now. Um, baseline hospital discharge, uh, uh, three months, six months, and 12 months. We're taking a look at the quality of life, including functional status with a six minute walk, some items from their medical chart, and I'll go over these with anyone who wants to hear. Basically, we need to have some um, legacy measures because in order to provide uh, con uh, congruent validity, um, or, uh, we need to have some established measures to compare parts of our newer tool to see. So we um, have the uh, screen for depressive symptoms, for anxiety. Um, we've got our new tool. We've got the Euroqual, which is uh, typical with all bad patients. Uh, Kansas City for heart failure, and then this is spiritual well-being, the facet or face it, which was um, really fun to be able to find that and talk with the author of that. For neurocognitive, we also added the R bands, trail making A and B. Then for neurocognition, and um, as we look ahead, um, then um, we will have a couple of uh, we'll have a couple studies that are um, adding additional sites. Um, with the stem cell therapy, and these are autologous stem cells, in case you're wondering then. So these are patients uh, donating their own stem cells um, uh, upon their LVAD placement, and then um, looking to see when they're, um, uh, when they're put back in, then if they're gonna have any improvement to them with their LVAD and stem cell therapy. So we need convergent validity, reliability, a lot of testing needs to be done. We're excited, um, one of our posters uh, uh, was accepted for presentation here uh, this next month in San Diego at the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. And this is the conference to go to if you are interested in quality of life with a ventricular assist device. So um, what we're hoping would come out of this are several things. Not just, I like to do research, and research is fun, but really practical application. Can we help patients better understand what they're getting into? Um, and then can we, can we possibly compare different devices um, then? Uh, and then issues for support groups. Our social worker and our chaplain lead the support groups. What can they target? What really needs to be targeted? And maybe we can even measure outcomes with interventions, different ways to do support groups. We have people from all over the you know, four states around us. Can we do something with virtual uh, uh, support groups? We're excited to look at that too. Um, and then uh, trying to identify strengths of an individual patient. If they're not where they want to be physically, can we help them accentuate other domains that are important to them? And then specific concerns and also really utilizing palliative care. Because at some point, we need to be able to uh, listen if a patient is telling us they're 89 years old or ready to be done with their LVAD. So really remember to integrate palliative care. So that's all I have. I thank you so much for your time that you spent with me here today, and um, and have a good rest of your morning.